Hello everyone and welcome back to Atman Unlimited. We're going to make another part for the first robotics teams again. So as we made a part before last time, we made the base plate in the last video. Uh, this part is going to be on the next level up. This is going to be a ring that's going to sit on the base plate and it's going to have a mating groove in it that the plastic balls will ride in so that the ring can rotate freely. And then everything else is going to be built on top of this ring. Uh, so this part was fairly easy to make. It was just a round ring with the groove in it, a couple of drill holes, countersinks. Uh, this part was much easier to keep flat because it's a lot smaller. It's only about six and a half inches in diameter. So we were able to easily clamp it and machine it. We got this part flat to within about two thousands, uh, which is halfway decent um, considering the way that I held it and clamped it. So without further ado, let's go down to the office. We'll go through the cam again and then uh, we'll run the part in the machine. Here's the part we're going to be machining in this video. Now this is uh, just a simple ring, but it's got this bearing groove in it again. Now this ring is going to be the interface ring that's going to sit down on top of that base plate we machined in the last video, and then it will capture the plastic balls between this groove and the groove in the base plate. Then these holes are for the superstructure to bolt to, and then that will allow anything bolted to this ring to make a full rotation. So we're going to machine this part in two setups and four operations. So we're going to start with OP10, and we're just going to mill this out of a piece of plate stock, again, just like the last part. And what we did is we are going to clear the center out. So we're going to use a three inch, or I'm sorry, a three quarter inch uh, roughing mill. Then after the center's gone, uh, we're going to face this edge here with our two inch face mill. Now we're going to put all these holes in. And then from here to here, oops, sorry, except for the countersink. So all of these operations are just copy and pasted from the first part we did because we're machining the exact same geometry here in the opposite groove so we can use all the exact same tooling paths so this was a you know almost a no time operation to copy and paste that in so then once we get the bearing in we're going to countersink these as well so these are just straight through holes so those are your uh, mounting holes for some bolts and then we will run around and finish the ID and then we're just going to chamfer chamfer the ID. Now that's OP10. Now for OP20 we're going to move and do the outside. Now when I'm moving the clamps I didn't videotape any of the setup. Um, in the next parts I'll, I'll do that. I got a lot of questions on the setups. So the, the first setup we're just going to clamp the four corners here and you'll see that in the machining video coming up. Um, and then in the second op, what we do is we put some T-nuts in the table ahead of time underneath the part in the center. And then once this center area is cleared out, then we'll install two toe clamps here and then one here. So one toe clamp here, one toe clamp here, so two clamps. And then after these are installed and torqued down, we will remove these four clamps. Okay, that way the part never moves and you never have to worry about shifting offsets. So then we're going to do the exact same thing uh, we did on the base and just cut off the rough stock rather than turning it to chips. It'll go pretty quick. Um, and if you notice here, I'm only cutting 90 degrees at a time. And the reason for that again is so that if you try to do a 180, um, and the piece starts to kick out, you know, it can catch on this upper edge and maybe shift in a funny way and hit the end mill, and then you'll have a projectile potentially flying across inside the machine cabinet. Um, so then once all the drops are off, then we'll just do a nice full contour, and then we'll come back and chamfer, and that will complete OP20. Now we have to remove the part uh, from, the ta from the table and flip it over for OP30. So we'll do a flip like this, or I'm sorry, flip like that. And then our origin is going to be in the center of the bottom of the part. And now we're going to clamp the part 
right to the table. So we would machine this side nice and flat. And uh, this part's a lot easier to get flat. The OD is only, uh, what, six and a half inches roughly? So it's not as big a part as that big plate was, so it's pretty easy to get this flat. Um, so then we're going to flip it, and we're going to clamp it right to the table because we don't have any through operations. And then we're going to come, and we're just going to clear off this shelf right here. Then we'll just do a finish pass, and then we're going to chamfer um, this lower edge. I think I chamfered the upper edge too. So that'll be OP30. Now OP30 is done, again, with the clamps on the inside. So we clamp it on the inside, um, then we take our indicator and we find the center, and then the Z bottom is the table, so our Z offset is zero. Okay, so that's OP30. And then OP40, we're going to move the clamps to the outside, and we're going to clamp on this rim here. So this is how we're going to hold it down, and this is going to look a little hokey, but it, it worked out very well. Um, I'll explain how I held this down in the machining part again. But um, I didn't hold it down very hard because I was just holding it on this little lip. Um, so I told the face mill to take really light cuts. It didn't add that much machining time to it. And again, the goal here is not to make the part fast. The goal is to make the part right the first time because making it twice takes twice as long, right? So if we, you know, spend an extra 10 or 15 minutes, that's not a big deal is trying to make the part twice. So then after the facing, we're just going to do the chamfer. So yeah, I did this upper chamfer uh, in this operation. So that's, uh, that's the cam and the machining operations and the part. This is a fairly simple part. Um, so let's jump into it and watch it get made. So here's our first setup and our first operation. You can see we just have it clamped in the corner and we have some sacrificial stock laid down so that we don't go through the table. We're going to drill all the way through the part and machine all the way through the part. So as we showed in the Fusion cam, we're going to start with the 3 quarter inch rougher. We're doing a helical plunge here. I didn't bother to pre-drill on this, on this guy. And then now, uh, once we get all the way through the material, we'll, we'll speed up and uh, go to any, the adaptive clearing. I think we're going at 50 inches per minute on this. This is just a high-speed steel uh, tool. So you kind of get the idea. We'll skip ahead here. So there, we're almost finished up uh, carving out that ID. Now we're going to come in there with a the face mill. We're just going to face off the part of the material that is going to be the leftover on the part. So we're actually doing a contour uh, operation. This is a 2D contour, and I basically select the OD of the part that I want to contour, and then I set a negative um, tool radial offset. So then it um, will give enough overlap where I know I'm facing off the whole part. So we're going to spot drill, then we'll come back in with our drills. No tap holes on this part. And then comes the long, uh, laborious task of making this O-ring group. And again, it, it took so long because I, I didn't use the right tools. Um, I should have used a stub length uh, eighth inch mill and a stub length. 16-inch mill. I just didn't have any in stock at the time and I didn't want to wait to order some in. So after we rough out the groove with the 8-inch mill, we'll come back and we'll do all these little color bores. Again, I'm just loading less tools in the machine. That's why I use the 8-inch mill. So this is the 16-inch mill and just like in the last video, we're putting the groove in the bottom um, of this bearing race. And again, that's just to provide a little tiny bit of clearance for the bearing, and then it also helps with the ball mill when we come in and uh, ball it out the ball mill. So same operation with the ball mill as before. We'll do one pass, a rough pass, uh, to get the majority of the material out, and then we'll do a second pass uh, to come back and clean it 
Canada. And then after that, we're going to switch to our 3 8 mill. And again, I tried to keep the tool set between all of these parts identical so I didn't have to swap tools uh, in between all of these parts. So 3 inch diameter, uh, standard end mill. This is carbide. And then we're just going to do a finish pass. And this is going to get rid of the little bit of rough finish that the roughing mill leaves. And we got our chamfer mill out, and we are going to go around and chamfer all of our edges. I always, as practice, uh, try to chamfer an edge break as much as I can inside the machine uh, and save the hand labor. And then that will complete uh, op 10. Now you can see we have the toe clamps moved. And again, we put the inside ones on first, and then we took off the four in the corners. And now we're going to go through and we're going to slot out the big chunks of material and drop them off the part. And if you calculate the amount of time on how long it takes to do this versus just turning that material into chips, you know, it can be about a wash depending on how big of a chunk you're going to drop off. Um, what it does save you is, is it does save you tool life because the cutting edge of the tool doesn't have to go through all that material. So then after the piece drops off, I put in a, a hard stop in the code so then I can safely uh, open the doors and just get that piece of drop out of the way. Not a good idea to leave it there. Um, if it drops off into your ways or in an axis, it can bind up. So you want to make sure that you watch where your drops fall. And then we just repeat the process three more times. Get rid of the rest of its bleh, get rid of the rest of this material. Once all the material is gone, we'll do the same thing we did before and do a nice finish pass with a spring pass, get a good finish and bring the part to size. Then we'll uh, chamfer the outside. I used a little bit slower feed rate in the chamfer mill just because I wasn't quite sure how close I was going to come to the toe clamp um, bolts. So now this is op 30. This is the second setup. So we flip the part over, we have it uh, clamped down onto the table, so it's on a nice firm flat surface now. And we've got two toe clamps in the middle, and now we're going to put that uh, little shelf on it. And this is just an adaptive clearing. I think we're doing 50 inches a minute with, um, no, I think it's a 50 or 100 thou step over. Again, not horribly aggressive, but gets the job done. Then we'll do a finish pass and a spring pass. Then all that's left to do on op 30 is to do the chamfer.
Now we're gonna clamp the outside of the part. You can see how we've got this kind of clamped a little differently. So what I did is I took round square stock or rectangular stock that I've had and it's 3 8 by quarter and then I took this, the, the tips of them over to the bench grinder and I ground off about 60 to 70 thousand stock quartering back and that gave me enough clearance to walk the face mill around and the chamfer mill around so that I can clamp the part on that, that bottom lip and then machine the very top of the part without having to worry about hitting the clamps. Now those, uh, I know you're not supposed to do that with parallels, those are old parallels that are already bent up, so no big deal. And uh, the thickness of the lip is an eighth inch thick, and the thickness of the standard set of parallels is an eighth inch, so they just worked out good. And then we toe clamp them uh, in the center. Now what I didn't do is I didn't bother machine chamfering any of the holes on the back of the part. And the reason for that is if I did that I'd have to worry about clocking the part. Um, because I'm only chamfering the major diameters and the inside diameter of the part, I don't have to clock it. So this is one case where it's going to be quicker to hand chamfer um, the drill holes rather than spend time trying to clock the part so that the chamfers line up with the holes. Now I'm going really slow here um, because I only had about five or ten thou of clearance between the tip of the chamfer mill and the steel. So I set the feed rate up for steel in a slotting configuration um, just in case I nipped uh, one of the work holdings it wouldn't destroy the tip of the chamfer mill, so that's why I went so slow here. And you can see that the facing mill left a little, a little bit of a burr around the OD. And then we'll come back in and we'll do the, we'll do the ID. And that'll complete the part. Here's our finished part. Uh, it came out really nice. We got really good surface finishes. We are in spec and like I said our flatness is within about two thou. Uh, so I'm very happy with the way this part came out. And again these are for the FIRST Robotics team and FIRST Robotics is a, a wonderful um, organization that gets uh, kids involved in engineering and sciences. Uh, so if you get the opportunity to help out or volunteer for FIRST I would, I would uh, definitely recommend doing it. Uh, it's a lot of fun, and it's, it's really cool to see what the kids come up with. So I hope you enjoyed uh, watching how we make this part. We've got a whole bunch more parts that we made, and we'll make videos on those uh, coming up in the next couple of weeks. So thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next one.